This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. All right, so we have today John Cassani. John, I know you follow us on Twitter. Do I see you anywhere else? You might occasionally see me in uh, the Gene Wolf Appreciation Society on Facebook. And occasionally commenting other places too. I, I, th- I remember you there. I do remember seeing you there. So where are you from? Uh, I am from, I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, born and raised in Michigan, and uh, moved a little bit all over the state, but have been here for about, gosh, 20, 21 years now. What about you? I, I'm in Austin, and I've, yeah, I've lived in Texas since I was 14, so that's about 42 years. Yeah, so I've lived pretty much all over Texas, <laughs> and I'm living in Austin now. That's fantastic. Nice. How'd you find out about uh, the podcast? Uh, so I began to read Wolf and like a lot of people, I imagine, started looking for secondary sources because I was not clever enough to figure all this stuff out on my own <laughs> and uh, discovered uh, this podcast, a couple of other Wolf related podcasts and and really enjoy it. Really enjoy both the standard podcast that you're doing, but also these reader interviews. I think it's a nice... Get a sense that there's there is a, a community of, of wolf readers. Yeah, I could do these all day long, every day. Well, all right. Are you ready to play our game? I'm ready. Okay. I am not. Hang on. <laughs> I don't know why. I if I was forced to, I could probably just recite these off the top of my head, but I'm never willing to do that. I, I do the same. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, first encounter with a wolf story. Yeah. So so for me, it was uh, the night. I don't know how traditional and entry point that is for wolf but i'd heard a lot about him read a lot of praise and decided to check this book out and for whatever reason i only read the first few chapters i can't really justify or account for why i didn't finish it but i do remember those opening chapters being really haunting and beautiful in a way that was different than a lot of what i was reading at the time at the time, I was reading a lot of, um, gosh, like Mar Namis, Saul Bellow, Nabokov, Updike, some of these more exuberant pro stylists or, or maximalists, you might call them, people who really put a lot of oomph into it. And this this was not very much like that, but I did think that it had a lot of pretty incredible pieces of or moments of, of, of prose in a much different way, in a way that was a lot plainer, this unadorned, almost a naive style, right, matched to that that narrator if you don't mind i thought i could read a couple of um passages that i that really resonated with me right yeah great uh the first and these are both from the first couple of chapters or maybe the first chapter yeah yeah bring it on wolf writes the sun stretched out his hands into our cave and blessed us both or that was the way it seemed then he sank into the sea and the sea tried to follow him and i just thought that was beautiful uh I also love this from that same opening chapter when, when he's our protagonist, Abel, is leaving Parker's cave. <laughs> he says, uh, when I waved goodbye, it seemed like the whole cave was full of white birds flying and fluttering. She waved back. She looked very small then, like the flame of a candle. And, uh, you know, although I didn't finish the book, I remember that those lines were really mysterious and, and haunting to me. And... For whatever reason, I, I put Wolf down for a while. A few years later, came to the best of Gene Wolf, and it was just all over after that. There was no going back. Yeah, but you know, bouncing off the first Gene Wolf book for no particular reason at all is actually not all that uncommon. How old were you? Oh, gosh, I would have been, this is 2004. I would have been 24. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's just such a different kind of book. It's not what you're ever expecting it to be or whatever, whatever story it is. It's always different than you expect. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it's, you know, it's not, a, it's not exactly a typical wolf book, but I'm not sure that there is a typical wolf book really. With, with the night being your first entry in the wolf, I'm not surprised you would say that <laughs> because, <laughs> because then you would probably encounter all those early wolf novels that everyone yeah. raves about and they are quite different. They're certainly quite different from the night. Right. 
Okay. Well, yeah. So what did you just read the best of Gene Wolfe just from front to back? Is that how you did it? Or did you skip around? Yeah, front to back. I know that's very literal minded, probably, but that's what I did. And uh, so that book starts out with the island of Dr. Death and other stories, right? And right. That's a that's a masterpiece, I think. And the toy theaters, one of my favorite wolf stories. I just love it. Uh, mm-hmm. And then it moved on to the fifth head of Cerberus, the novella. And after I read that, I, I thought, okay, <laughs> I've got to read everything this guy ever wrote. <laughs> yeah, there's no going back. Right. Yeah, that was probably uh, the fifth, fifth head of Cerberus. Probably was what put me over the line. I'd read the uh, the book of the New Sun, and I came away thinking, I mean, he's an amazing creator of worlds. Yeah, so so writer. Okay. And then I read <laughs> then I read the fifth head of Cerberus, and I said, oh, oh, now I get it. Okay. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, favorite wolf word. Favorite wolf word for me is uh, I think it's demi mundane, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Oh yes, yeah, from the fifth head of right? <laughs> yeah, and it's not a word I'd encountered before that I remember, but I, I think it's a beautiful word for what's probably not a very beautiful <laughs> profession. Yeah, beautiful. Yes, a personal non-consensus theory about a wolf story, or your favorite one. You know, it's got to be one of Mark Aramini's. Mm -hmm. He is such a generous and energetic scholar and advocate for Wolf and someone who, as far as I can tell, in every interaction I've seen with him online is is very quick to offer assistance and to to share his love of the writer. And in terms of the, the theory of his that I love most, I think it probably is his theory on the Wizard Knight and which I eventually, of course, went back and reread those books, but. I won't spoil his theory, but the first time I, I read it... I... No, spoil... <laughs> We're, we, we spoil things here. <laughs> what, spoil his theory. Oh, I couldn't do that. Or at least say what you, or at least say the part that you really, really like. Well, so so his, his theory in part is that Abel, the protagonist of The Wizard Knight, was never in fact born. And that the novel, in a sense, is a dream, or to some degree is a dream that was sent to his mother by the archangel Michael. And... That a lot of what we see is strange in that in those books is really symbolic of of uh, mm-hmm. being in the womb, for instance. And I, I I read this and I thought, you know, Mark's a nice guy, but I don't know, man, he's lost it. <laughs> but then I, I read it again, I read the book again, and realized he's absolutely right. So how he made that intuitive leap to be able to discern that very 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 hidden story is just beyond me. But I'm glad he did it. No, no, I. I can see all of the paths that he took to get there. I mean, there's Parka for one thing, right? Yeah. And uh, I probably, it's probably a theory I might have kind of thought about, oh, look look all this connection to childbirth and would have discounted, Mm -hmm. but uh, but Mark pushes right on forward. Yeah. He's sort of tireless, I think. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. Um, Favorite novel or short story, either or both? Gosh, I feel like I could... I could answer f- favorite novel, favorite short story, um, favorite novella, favorite series. If I could cheat and, and do a novella, sure, I would pick the fifth head of Cerberus. Actually. Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. And I think uh, it'd be for a couple of reasons. One is it was the first uh, work of Wolf's I read that really blew me away. Mm-hmm. It's got that it's got that great atmosphere. It's the sort of decayed elegance. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's set halfway between. New Orleans and hell, maybe. Right. You've got the, the the squalor of the neighborhood. I think he describes at one point the peeling grandeur of the library. And it's, there's such, you know, I, I think when we talk about Wolf, those of us who do, we tend to talk about his subtlety and his, and his desire to hide things. And how on a second reading or a third or a fourth, you're going to find something that will reveal something fundamental about the story that you missed. And and I think that makes sense that we talk about those things because nobody else does it in the same way that he does or, or to the degree that he does. But in his later works, especially, I think that sometimes the scales get out of balance and he's so focused on creating the mystery that he doesn't provide the surface pleasure or the pleasure to a first time reader that some of those early books do. And I think that Fifth Third succeeds on both levels, especially being such a joy to read even the first time. Mm hmm. If I can quote again, there's there's that great description of the demi mundanes where he says, uh, he says, their skirts reflected their wearers' faces and busts as still water does the standing trees near it. Yep. 
so that they appeared in the intermittent colored flashes like the queen, uh, the queens rather, of strange suits in a tarot deck. I mean, how great is that, right? I just love it. And I, I think that the images are beautiful. The language is beautiful. And having read The Night or part of The Night, I was blown away by the difference in style. And I think that that's probably the first time it occurred to me that you can and probably should alter your style based on the story that you're telling. Mm -hmm. So I I tend to prefer the more ornate language that he uses here or in, say, Seven American Nights, which is another favorite, uh, The Book of the New Sun piece. But all of it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he can pull out the Baroque language whenever he wants to, which is what he he proved with... uh, book of the short sun right yeah right he left he left it behind for years and then oh yeah i can do that <laughs> right <laughs> so. it's, it's not that he lost his stuff or that he lost capacity right um he was just right. looking in a different direction and i and i think to fifth head of cerberus is an, an example there are other examples of wolf but i think that he has such a, a degree of empathy for that boy that main character number five mm-hmm. and at the same time there's a, a level of almost coldness or removal on the part of the writing. Yeah. And th- he manages to combine that level of feeling of depth and of heart with his forbidding intellect. And I don't know if I want anything more than that, you know, from a story. <laughs> a lot of times his his characters are are bad guys. Yeah. But he, he, he treats them with such um, generosity that sometimes you don't even realize it, right? Yeah, that's that's a great way to put it. I I think in part, I think you're absolutely right that that occurs. And I think, too, he does what Nabokov sometimes does in the sense that he's giving his he's giving Severian or number Mm -hmm. five his powers of language and style. And so it's easy to become seduced by that. And plus, you're reading a first person Mm -hmm. narrative. Right. And we're all heroes in our own stories. Yeah, right. Exactly. And so as a reader, it's easy to get swept away by that and lose track of the fact that some of these people are doing pretty awful things. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I think of the eel guest. Yeah. Gideon Chase, you know, he's a bad guy. He's a good guy. Reese, Reese is a bad guy. Uh, I remember Wolf saying about him that the best villain is someone who's almost a hero but fails. Mm, that's fantastic. Yeah, I think that you uh, you make a really good point there. And yeah, to your point about the writer being the hero, Wolf is also a master of that sort of unreliable narrator who is concealing or maybe doesn't even recognize his own flaws. And certainly Fifth had a Cerberus that, that occurs. Right, exactly. All right, well, most frustrating mystery in a Wolf story. Any. This is very minor. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> it's because it's such a minor one that, that it annoys me. In the Era Mispian Legacy short story, mm-hmm. our narrator, he finds this magnifying glass that bears the initials MH. And we don't learn who MH was, but because it's Gene Wolf, I'm pretty confident that Wolf knew who MH was <laughs> and, and left us enough clues to figure it out. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I think what frustrates me what frustrates me about it is the sense that I have that it really doesn't matter, but it's like this itch at the back of my brain and I I just need to, at some point, solve it. How do you know it doesn't matter until you find out what it is? (laughs) That's that's a good point. It could matter. (laughs) It could be the clue. It could be that that reveals everything. Which, you know, it's funny in, in Wolf with his mysteries, I think that there are a lot of narrative works of art that promise a lot more mystery wise than they deliver. Mm-hmm. I think of a TV show like Lost, which made so many promises. Oh, famously. Yeah, right. And didn't didn't fulfill them. And that's one of the amazing things about Wolf is that the mysteries have answers and the answers are satisfying. So somebody out there, somebody out there must know what MH means, um, but it's not me. Well, well, I'm sure there'll be a discussion about that after this. And, and we'll probably both uh, learn because I haven't really spent a lot of time. That's a problem I have with going through Wolf's works in, in total. There's still a lot of works I haven't, uh, short stories I haven't read because it's, it, I can't just go on to the next one if I don't even understand what the, what the one I just read means. Right. Uh-huh. Yep. No, that makes sense. Yeah. This is a, if you haven't read this one, this is a pretty, this is a pretty good one about, uh, I, well, I won't spoil it, but <laughs> there's some fun stuff going on. <laughs> well, you're welcome to do, well, is, is it summarizable? Uh, I think so. It's, it's about a man who his best friend discovers a book that he, the best friend, believes has secret knowledge that that might help him 
become master of the world. Mm-hmm. There are griffins too. Yeah. Yeah. Very weird fictiony. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Okay. That's awesome. Anything else? Gosh, I probably have more to say than I deserve to say. <laughs> I, I think there there can be, if you're a reader of Wolf, the sense that there are titans of scholarship out there who have read deeper and paid better attention and made connections that, that I certainly haven't made. And so I think it is possible to, to read Wolf and um, almost in an insecure way. But I think it, as long as you're getting pleasure out of what you're reading and you're open to discovering what's in the text, even if that takes a few times, then it's worth that it's worth doing. Yeah. Well, uh, often the pleasure I get from a wolf story is kind of the pleasure I get from working all day in the garden. <laughs> it's it, I, 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 it makes me ache. <laughs> and, uh, sure. and my first, you know, my first read is, is always my least enjoyable one. <laughs> Cause I'm just trying, I'm just trying to get through it so I can read, you know, read it for real. Uh huh. Same. But it's it's also great that there is an artist and a writer whose work becomes better the more you read it. I think that's incredibly rare, right? I, I I love Stephen King and I read a lot of Stephen King stuff, but his books tend not to improve the second or third time through. <laughs> yeah, I can get that. I can get that. As, but yeah, when you know the ending, a lot of times a lot of times the the ending is the kind of the worst part. In fact, I think he seems to me that in one of the recent cinematic portrayals. Uh, of of his stories mm-hmm. there's it, it stars a writer naturally right and uh he's and he says yeah you know people complain about i didn't like the ending yeah the endings are hard <laughs> <laughs> never his greatest strengths whereas in wolf you 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 eventually begin to piece together what what might have happened at the end yes yeah, so, right you're right the ending isn't really the ending though right and you discover that the beginning wasn't the beginning and the middle was someplace off page someplace exactly all right well this was really good thank you no thank you so much james oh yeah yeah i I, know like i said i can do this all the time this was sponsored entirely by the patrons of the rereading wolf podcast you can go to patreon.com slash rereading wolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world and if you want to take on the five questions with us reach out by email or by one of the other methods listed in the show notes to this episode